Okay, so the next chapter we're going to talk about deals with gases and what's called gas laws. And it's actually kind of, um, it's kind of cool how they work. They're very, very predictable, uh, the way gases work. And so when it comes to dealing with gases, we're going to first talk about the properties of them, and we're talking about something called pressure, which may not be something you're familiar with. So with a gas particle, gas molecules, I want you guys to think of little ping pong balls bouncing around inside a balloon. Okay, and so they're constantly moving all kinds of directions, three dimensions, wherever they need to go. And this state of matter has a lot of motion associated with it. And if they're at the same temperature, it doesn't matter what it is, room temperature or any other temperature, is they're a gas, they have the same average kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. And so if you increase the temperature, these little particles, they start going haywire. And you'll see that. We're going to do a little simulation with this, and you'll see how start they start moving a lot faster. If you drop the temperature, they start to slow down because they're losing kinetic energy. And so when we're talking about gases, we're talking about particles that are very far, far, far away from each other. They are in constant motion. They rarely come in contact with each other, that kind of thing. So why do some materials become gases? Why is oxygen a gas and water is a liquid? I mean, why? Or why is oxygen a gas and salt is a solid? Well, it all comes back to those <coughs> intermolecular attractive forces we were talking about in the bonding chapter. So with solids, they have a definite shape and a volume, and the molecules stay pretty much locked in one place because they're intermolecular attractive forces. If it's ionic, or if it's hydrogen bonding, whatever. Based on the temperature, they're kind of locked into place as a crystal. Okay, And as temperature goes up, they start moving faster and faster, and eventually they can break apart and turn into a liquid. Liquids have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. They're in motion, Okay, so they're not stuck in one place. They are motion, moving around, but they're constantly in contact with each other. And their intermolecular attractive forces may not be as strong based on the temperature. So water, if you drop the temperature below zero degrees C, turns into this, because it's not a high enough temperature to allow them to have the kinetic energy to slide past each other. If it's between zero degrees and 100 degrees, they're in constant motion with each other. They have enough kinetic energy to slide past each other, break some of those intermolecular attractive forces, but not necessarily completely fly apart from each other. Then for a gas, they have lots of kinetic energy because for water, above 100 degrees, all of a sudden they have enough kinetic energy that they are flying around all over the place. They have completely broken those intermolecular attractive forces. So this is a picture of what they look like. Like I said, think of these as ping pong balls moving around inside a box or a balloon, whatever. So the big idea with gases is they expand to fill their container, whatever their container is. They exert pressure, and okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, and they can be compressed. You can squish them, okay, because they are in a relatively low density state, and there's empty space between them. Not air, empty space. And so you can squish those, those ping pong balls closer together because there is no air in between them. They're gas particles. So they are very susceptible to changes in temperature, volume, and pressure, much more so than solids and liquids. So let's talk about what pressure is. Well, pressure is force per unit area. If you haven't had physics, it's basically how much pushing you're doing on a particular area. Okay, Gas pressure for gas is the result of those little ping pong balls bouncing around inside my container hitting the walls. So I've got my container, I've got my ping pong balls all bouncing around, and as they hit that container, they are causing pressure. That's what the pressure is. The more they hit, the greater the pressure. Okay, That's literally what it is. It's the collisions of the molecules hitting the walls of the container. And the more collisions there are, the greater the pressure becomes. So how do we measure pressure? Well, we're going to, pressure has actually been around a long time. It's really important to people who fly airplanes, weather, um, you know, any kind of space related stuff because you have to fly through the atmosphere. So pressure is really a big deal. It's been around a long time. And so they used to use these things called barometers and they still actually do, although they don't look like this. And a barometer is basically the old style is a little puddle of mercury and they have this tube and it's called a barometer and it's got layers or lines on it, markings. 
And if you put a vacuum in that, so there's no air up here, there's nothing in there, there's no ping pong balls bouncing on the, on the, mole, on the liquid mercury, what will happen is, is the air, which is a gas, is going to push down on the mercury and push it up inside the tube to a height of literally measuring it with a ruler 760 millimeters, three quarters of a meter. That's how high it pushes it at sea level. That's standard atmospheric pressure. It depends totally on weather and altitude for sure. Colorado, this is definitely a big deal here. Now, manometers are a different way of reading the pressure. They compare the pressure of a gas in a container to whatever the external pressure is outside. So if the pressure on the atmosphere is equal to the pressure of the gas, then the levels of the mercury will be the same, and I'll show you what they look like. If the pressure of the gas is greater than the external pressure, it will push the mercury further and create different levels, and you'll see. So this is what a manometer is. Here's my little gas, all right, my little ping pong balls, bouncing around inside this tube. And this is a liquid, and they're pushing down on this liquid here. Out here, I have air. It is also a bunch of ping pong balls, and it is pushing down on the liquid. And if you think about it that way, pressure is pushing. If you look at this, I think it's pretty obvious that this liquid, if it is a liquid, and it moves, that the outside pressure is greater than the inside pressure because it is pushing that mercury down farther than this one is. If they were equal at that level, then you would say the pressures are the same. But since they are significantly different, this one is greater than that one in terms of its ability to push on the mercury. So the column of mercury inside moves up and down depending on which pressure is higher, and that's the way you want to think about it. In this case, the H value, and literally they measure it with a ruler, is how much lower the pressure is inside than the pressure is outside. That's the way you want to think of it. Okay, now this one is the reverse. If you look, here's my little ping pong balls, and they are pushing down on this liquid mercury, and then I have air, which also is the ping pong ball idea, pushing down on the mercury, and in this case I think it's pretty obvious that the pressure inside the container, the pressure of the gas, is greater than the pressure of the air. The pressure inside is greater than the pressure outside. Okay. So basically what you want to do when you're doing these kind of problems, and I'll show you what it looks like, um, you want to pay attention to where the pressure is greater. That's what you want to think about. Which one is pushing harder? Don't think about adding and subtracting automatically. Just think about where is it bigger. Okay, that's what you want to do. So sample problem in the manometer to the left, H is 17 millimeters of mercury and the outside pressure is 685 millimeters of mercury. Literally, that's where they get the term. They measure it with a millimeter ruler, and it is mercury. So the outside pressure is pushing down with 685. The H value is 17. Now, if you look at this, you want to think about it. The pressure of the gas inside is less than the pressure of the air outside because the outside's pushing harder. So if my outside has a pressure of 685, that means my inside has to be less than that, and it's actually 685 minus 17, whatever that is, 668, something like that, okay? Now let's look at this one. Again, you want to think about the pressure of the gas compared to the pressure of the air. So the pressure of the air is pushing down here, the pressure of the gas is pushing down here. And so in this problem, let me erase this stuff up here, the um, H value is given as 75, and the inside pressure is 225, okay? Again, pressure of the gas is greater than the pressure of the air because of the pushing. That means 225 has to be greater than whatever the pressure of the air is. Well, the pressure of the air would be 225 minus 75. Oops. Like I said, I don't want you guys to think about it in terms of adding and subtracting. Well, that's just annoying. So it's 150. Okay, I want you to think about it in terms of where is the bigger number? Where is the bigger number? That's what you always want to think about it and just make it work. Okay, now pressure comes in other units. The official SI unit is Pascal. A Pascal is kind of like a joule. It's really small. Okay, nobody uses Pascals. Um, the ones that are most commonly used are atmospheres and millimeters of mercury, and those are probably the two I will stick with. Um, there is one that they use, it's called the Kilo Pascal, and it is a thousand Pascals, and that's used occasionally. 
um, way more than Pascal is. So I'll give you some conversion factors. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters mercury is 101.3 kPa's, okay, kilopascals. There are other units of pressure that have been around a long time. Tor is the same exact thing as a millimeter mercury. And then PSI, and if you look on the outside tire of your bike or your car, you'll see that it tells you what pressure to inflate your tires to in pounds per square inch. That's what it stands for. But I will give you guys these. I don't expect you guys to memorize them. So make some conversions. Literally all you're going to do <coughs> is follow our conversion rules. 2.35 atmospheres. Atmospheres on the bottom. KPA is on the top. Look back at those conversions. Atmospheres has a 1 next to it. KPA is 101.3. And solve. Atmospheres cancels out, so you end up multiplying. Okay, if I have 90 PSI, 90 PSI, PSI on the bottom to cancel, millimeters of mercury on top, the conversion are 14.7 for PSI and 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, just multiply and divide. 650 tor to atmospheres, tor on the bottom, atmospheres on top. If you look at the conversions, atmospheres has a 1, tor is 760, tors cancels out, just divide in this case. And then the last one, you have 97.3 kPa, kPa on the bottom, millimeters of mercury on top, 760 and 101.3. And again, you're going to end up multiplying the top numbers, dividing by the bottom numbers. So it's standard conversion rules. I'll give you the conversions, you just have to kind of know how to use them.